All right, well, let's uh, let's put the button on this here. Welcome, Andrew Kern, to Peace Freaks. How are you doing today? Uh, doing pretty good. Excited to be on. Well, why don't you uh, Why don't you tell us a little bit about why you're an authority on something before we get into the meat of why I asked you on today? Why I'm an authority? Gosh. Well, I have read quite a bit of libertarian literature. I don't know, probably dozens of just libertarian books. And um, I've written, done quite a bit of research and written on on libertarian philosophy in general. Especially I found myself writing on immigration. It's not necessarily that it's like the most important issue for me, but it's something where like the nuances of libertarian libertarian philosophy kind of bubble up. It's like a, it's not a really simple issue. And so you can really, when you're exploring it, you can, you can really help to clarify things. So I think that's just why I've found myself writing a lot about it. Interesting. Uh, and where do you, where do you find that writing at? Uh, principledlibertarian.com. Uh, I started that website a couple years ago. Uh, it's the majority of the writings on there are mine and had a few other, few other contributors, but See, that's really what I was trying to get to with that question was... Get the, get the name out there. Get your, so we get can your get fucking your... plug in there. That's why you're an authority, because you have a website. You bought a URL. I, right I have a website, so now I am an authority, yes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how the internet works, isn't right. it? Okay. You, have, you own the URL, you're the authority. Yep. There you go. That's why Tom Woods is an authority. He has a lot of them. Well, he, has a li- <laughs> yeah. he also has a little more going for him than that. Well, yeah. Well... You know, talk to the left, talk to the lefties. They'll say, oh, he's got a lot of racism and stuff like oh, that. Oh, the love of Pete. <laughs> yeah, according to some people, the websites are all he has going for him. <laughs> yeah, he's never written a single book. So Ooh, the reason I asked you on today is because if you, you can talk to my wife, Liz, here, I've been freaking out for fucking weeks. <laughs> um, because in particular, I have issues with with the whole immigration debate and the way that it gets framed. And especially when it comes to the Mises Institute types. It is the one thing that I, I will forever think Lou Rockwell is completely fucking bonkers on. And my the reason is because every time I've ever heard anyone talk about immigration, there's specific key points that they all make. And for me, it always ends up ways of just justifying very, very non-libertarian position. And to me, it's it's because especially in that particular place, they put their conservatism ahead of their libertarianism. So this whole thing is centered around Dave Smith for the past couple of weeks has been more outspoken about his particular views on it and kind of him putting, throwing his lot in with the Mises types, which makes sense considering, you know, he really does fall into that milieu. Those are clearly his libertarian type people. But, you know, he started having people, he had, a, you know, a guest on from Pickertarians, John Hudak, who kind of, Gave him a rebuttal that I literally just shook my head at. N- no offense to John, it just I-, I thought it was a weak showing. So a couple days passed. Dave's addressed it once or twice, and then all of a sudden it pops up that he you did a rebuttal on the principled libertarian, and he actually read it on the show and kind of line by line approached it. Uh, I'm curious if you actually listened to his rebuttal yet. Oh yeah, yeah I did. What do you, what are you what are you your thoughts on his rebuttal? I thought it was kind of glib in some of the ways he approached it. Honestly. Well, by the way, to be fair, like. There are plenty of people at the Mises Institute who are, you know, pretty open borders, like Walter Block or Jeff Deese actually just emphasizes decentralization. But I'm not saying everyone over there is a monolith. There's clearly different thinkers. Uh, unfortunately, I'm kind of using Lou as a stand-in uh, for the Mises Institute in this respect. Yeah. Okay. So when I replied to Dave, I was trying to show that. Well, he likes he loves to emphasize that upholding property rights is the definition of libertarianism, and I think that is definitely an important value. But there's limitations to that. You know, when you want to decide government policy on like on public land, like on roads or any other public property, you can't just say like uphold property rights because there's there's, you know, that's not owned by a private person. You know, if a if a road was owned privately, we could say the private owner can do whatever he wants because that's his property right. So that's why my contention was, you know, just appealing to property rights doesn't really answer questions about like especially well, about immigration, because immigration gets at who is allowed onto like public property, not as well as like it's prohibiting immigrants from going onto private property. But the main thing that closed border types will object to is them being allowed on the public property. Right. So Dave replied that I'm going to be honest, I, th- I feel like that's way down their list, like the way that they, yeah. they oh, talk yeah. about the article. Mm-hmm. That's like an afterthought is the actual thing that they should be using as their justification. But 
Yeah. Well, and I think there are plenty of people who have, I think, much worse reasons. Yeah. So Dave replied that property rights are, he just maintains that property rights are all we need. And I gave a couple, I think, pretty good arguments that they just don't answer all the questions. Right. Um, well, and I will, I will give a little bit of pushback. You're definitely, your approach to property rights is you're taking nuance and kind of making it something else. You're look, you and Dave are seeing things the same way. His contention specifically be that the things that you're looking at are just extensions of property rights. And in that, I kind of do, and this is purely a semantic thing. It's like, well, you guys clearly agree on this point. You're just, you you think those things aren't inherent property rights and he thinks that they are. But that will cause problems later on down the line because of some of his other uh, errors in thinking, in my opinion. Well, right. But it's just like, how do we, how do we determine what government policy should be on roads? Like, how can, how can you appeal to property rights on that? All, all you could say, right, is that we should privatize it. But until it's privatized, we need to do something else, you know? Well, and this is, and I, I, I'm not 100% because I, I haven't read all of this literature, but this is where the big issue that I have is. And it's it, to me, it's astounding that Dave makes this logical jump that he does, but he does, and he goes whole hog into it. And it's the idea that, well, since it's public property, we all we all need to be treated as property owners. And and to me that's that's so ludicrous. That's like believing that that's the case is like believing the police work for you. It's the same thing. Going out and saying, "Oh well, you work for me, officer." Any libertarian that knows what the fuck they're talking about knows that that's complete and utter horseshit. They work for the state, so you can't sit there and say that state-owned property is public property and is our property in the same way that you can say that. A police officer works for us. It, it, yeah, maybe in theory, but that theory is so far from reality. It's it's stolen goods. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah, the argument put forth by like usually I think Lou Rockwell and by Hoppe and probably Dave uh, likes it somewhat at least is yes, since people since you know we're paying taxes and then that's used on public property, then therefore that public property is ours, all of us who pay taxes. But we're not paying taxes. We're stolen from. And you either believe that <laughs> right. or you fucking don't believe it. Like, it's, you can't you can't make taxation not theft because you want to do something that you think is necessary. <laughs> That's why even, like, when he would get into this argument, like, with uh, Hudak about the guy in the school, I'm like, you're really, really taking this out of bounds. Like, the way that I've, like, been describing this to, like, to be a few people I have talked about it is, uh, and why I think that the only approach to, from a libertarian perspective, is open borders is that anything that involves, like, property and theft, which, especially the arguments you get, a lot of it is, well, they're going to use our money that's stolen from us. And the response to that seems to be, okay, well, let's go and shoot the people that bought stolen goods while hiring the people who stole those goods to shoot the people. And wait, they have to steal from us again to shoot the people that are buying the stolen goods. That, that is the, like how this all works out in essence. The Mexicans didn't steal the fucking, you know, didn't steal the money from us. The state did. So then you're then going to allow and justify the state stealing from you again to go and enforce these stupid fucking rules. And moreover, yeah, that- <laughs> like, moreover... Okay, so if that's the case and you think you can justify that, well, then literally the state can ju- force you to justify any action they want to take simply by making a bad decision. And then, well, they're tough cities. Now you got to you gotta handle the mess we made, and we're the only ones who can handle the mess. So congratulations. You got to buy more of our services. It's, it's fucking extortion, and it's, it's craziest idea to be. Yeah, that, so the, yeah, the idea that property it, or public property is taxpayer owned kind of yeah that overlooks like you said that overlooks the fact that it's going to take more theft to enforce that with police officers and such also i just think that's just like it's completely oversimplifying because like the government taxation is just one of innumerable crimes that the government does right yeah it, it doesn't just steal from people it also locks peaceful people up it bombs people so it seems like everyone at harms should have if i mean if you can follow that logic is going to have some lot, some claim to public property. I mean, even, you know, foreigners could because 
uh, maybe they're victims of foreign intervention. Well, I mean, how much of how much of that land could they probably justify we stole from them in fucking bad deals back when we pushed everybody out of the west side of the nation? Like, there's you, you, there's so many things that go into <laughs> like that. You know, is it maybe that their way of getting back a piece of what we bombed the fuck out of their countries or what our drug war has yeah, done to yeah. them? I think trying to trying to determine who like the legitimate owner of different pieces of public property is is just extremely difficult. And it's certainly not going to just be as simple as, well, whoever paid taxes. I have no idea how you would determine it. It's so complicated. And so I think all we can do as for now is operate as if, you know, no one owns it. It's not. Well, you know what we got to do? We got to go and pay more IRS agents to figure it out. And know, and then they're going to have to steal from us more to figure out this complicated situation that they set up and put us in. I guess it's just frustrating. Like, I don't see an end out of where they don't just justify us needing them more. I think that the immigration issue is just the the biggest place that that's visible. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, this is the this is the one issue for libertarians where, you know, some government intervention justifies more. And I think that's the opposite of everything else libertarians tend to do. You know, the fact that there are people are allowed to or, or the fact that people have access to some free health care. Does that justify banning alcohol and drugs so that they can't harm their bodies? I mean, no libertarians would never go that route. Well, even in this, even in his, the bullshit school analogy he threw at Hudak. Well, no, it justifies you not sending your fucking kids to a prison. No, you don't want more guards at the prison. I don't care if they're keeping out the bad guys. They're there to keep your kids in. That's what they're there for. Don't pretend in this one instance that it's something different. Yeah, we should be talking about getting kids out of school. I mean, ab- abolishing um, laws that require them to be there. Yeah. But like, I, I just feel like that example is just pointless because it doesn't doesn't translate over to immigration. OK, uh, fine. Yeah, we don't want heroin addicts in classrooms, but are lots of heroin addicts trying to get into classrooms. But are how is that? Are immigrants all heroin addi- addicts in classrooms? I mean, I, I don't get how that relates. What do you think, Liz? Uh, I'm just trying to follow some of the metaphors. I'm assuming you're like directly making references to things that have been said in this kind of ongoing exchange. Uh, to a degree, like the, the, the school metaphor was, well, I mean, if your kids are in school, even though they shouldn't be there and it's against, you know, libertarianism would never make that happen. Well, since they're there, we should have a cop there to protect the kids, you know, that kind of thing. Because you don't want a 40-year-old dude creeping around in the school. And that's how private property, a person who owns private property would protect that property. Yeah, well, I think Dave was just trying to make a point that we can't be dogmatic about absolutely zero government intervention while the state exists. Because, and he's just trying to use that example, like, well, you would want the public school to not allow heroin addicts in, right? So, okay, you'd say fine, but that doesn't prove anything about disallowing a bunch of foreigners in the country. And, and, and... And this is my personal position is that I think that that is a cop out. It's bullshit. Yes, we have to be 100 percent dogmatic, because if you're not 100 percent dogmatic, you just get into that endless cycle where the state forces you to justify its own existence. The thing that you don't believe puts you in a position where you have to keep ceding more power. Um, ultimately, if it fails, because it's like, if yes, some kids may die in that situation, but it's going to change a fuck ton faster than perpetuating the status quo. And, you know, maybe it's a couple legs kind of situation and it sucks. But is, you know, that any better than them dumbing down hundred, you know, the next hundred generations because we couldn't find a way out of it and just kept justifying it forever? Like, ultimately for me, and, and this is where, you know, I'm, I, I will probably part ways with you and Dave, is that for me, like, the, the whole NAP, the whole libertarian philosophy, like, I take that as my, my core principle, and come hell or high water, like especially with Dave, it, it fascinates me because he'll always make the case that, well, I believe this because it's moral and just, and this is the moral and just way to live. Well, you don't, if that's your primary concern, you don't just get to toss that out the window because you have a practical reason to want to do something else. And every excuse he seems to give in regard to it is a, is a very practical reason for, well, we can't just do that because, oh, you know, there's this and this and this. Either it's fucking morally wrong or it's not. You no, you're, you're right. Like, yeah, <laughs> Dave is... emphasizes Dave emphasizes all the time how he's all about the nap, you know, and yeah, and how it's a moral and legal principle. And that's that's all that matters in libertarianism and in politics. And so, yeah, you're right. And on this issue, all he does is appeal to utilitarian questions or cons- consequentialism. 
I mean, so, and that was the thing that I think that was my 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 biggest issue. With both you and Hudak and the approach was like Dave's the one who's constantly wading in the in the waters of I believe this because it's the moral approach. And I realize your forte is that you've done the reading, so I, I expect it from you. But I'm like Dave was a different situation. I'm like, man, why do we not throw right in his fucking face that this is an immoral belief? Either you think it's moral or you don't think it's moral. You draw your fucking line. And this is the one case like he said he jumps right into that practical water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, by the way, if you read Kaplan's stuff, it's not even all that fucking practical. <laughs> like, it really isn't. What do you mean? Well, I mean, so the big things that you'll get, obviously, are that they're they're soaking up all the tax dollars, which, if you actually get into it over their lifetimes, they all end up being net, net taxpayers. Also, if you want to talk about it, well, it's because of the voting block and the culture. Well, the fact of the fucking matter is, Dave, your culture's gone. Like, you lost that war. 50 years ago like we're just pretending that that war hasn't been lost texas is going to be a blue state and it has nothing to do with mexicans it's all those people all those yuppies moving from california to texas that are going to flip it the same that they've done throughout the country for years up until this point you remember when california used to be a fucking red state well it wasn't mexicans that changed that it was all the new york liberals that moved it. right yeah so that's what that's kind of what i did in my last article is yeah i'm emphasizing that like these fears you have of what might happen i think they're all pretty much overblown. Yeah. So I talk about voting. The big thing is like immigrants don't vote that often. <laughs> First of all, I mean, legal immigrants do, obviously, but they're at much lower levels than native born. And then obviously illegal immigrants, maybe some vote, but most don't. And that right. I mean, that's <laughs> tough. they're obviously not having that big of an impact. They're, they're voting at much lower rates than. But we have no than, way of knowing because they're illegal in there. The yeah. reporting on this is terrible. Oh, OK. Well, well, I'll grant that some vote, but obviously. Not that many are. But even, but my point is, even if that were the case, it's still not changing what's going to happen. Like, it's, what's he going to do? Buy another three, four year, you know, one more election cycle with the amount of, you know, the amount of immigrants that might vote? Well, I've looked this up before. Like, in California, I think it's like, uh, like 48, 47% or so of native born identify as Democrat. And then there's like 20 or so independents and like around 30%, maybe Republican. But, and then for immigrants, it's right around that 48 percent as well identifies Democrats. So they're not like any different. They're basically copying the when they come in, they're copying the ratio of how many people are already voting Democrat. So it's like it wasn't like you said, it wasn't immigrants that made California Democratic stronghold. Well, and you watch you, you watch it like little the little pockets of blue in Texas that are you know starting to pop up and starting to expand. It's it's not Mexican immigrants that are doing it. It's. It's all the people that are moving there from Silicon Valley because California is too expensive. They're they're fleeing the policies that they set up in California, the same as they do, they've done in New York. Well, we should probably ban immigration from California. Well, I <laughs> I would say this: it, it makes more sense at least. Like that's that's a legitimate thing that if you're gonna do it. And once again, it brings us back to that whole position. Like, obviously, Dave, you, me, we all understand, like, yes, the true libertarian position is private property decentralized to as far as you can possibly decentralize. So it's not like Dave's an unprincipled in that regard. It's just odd the concessions that he, that get made in this. And it's it's super frustrating because I think the way that he makes them is is odd to me. What do you think, like, the, the death knell is to, you know, to people that, do have this particular view on things like from your standpoint what is like the the big point that they they have to dance around i think just that they treat this issue so much different than every other issue and um by you know like 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 dave is always emphasizing the uh deontological aspect that aggression is wrong and that's all that matters as far as in politics anyway and but then he's making some sort of exception here where he's approaching it from different perspectives and trying to find workarounds. I don't know. I, maybe it's just that, you know, he has. Well, it's, it's funny to me because like I, I, I was listening to uh, Robbie talk uh, on run your mouth the other day and he had um sexy professor lady on and they were talking about Bastiat's the law, I believe. And he, he was kind of getting frustrated because he felt like he started meandering away from his premise in it where he started it out from a, a moral stance and then moved into, but here are the practical reasons you should support liberty. You know, the, the, this premise also. And at Bastiat the was doing it. <laughs> well, that's, that's the way Robbie read it. You know, he basically, I, Bastiat was, I guess, using it as support for his like thesis. Like, and it was basically a, and Hey, 
if the moral reason isn't enough for you, here are practical reasons. And Bobby, Bobby thought it was a little, he's like, it, it took away from the argument. And I thought, that's stupid. That's not possible. It, but then I start listening to, you know, Dave skip and jump around and kind of turn his back on his his footing on this. Like, well, I guess maybe it, like not keeping uh, coherent on your reason behind it does actually affect it. Because, I mean, even with me, it was all about these principles. It definitely felt differently when he started attacking it and looking at everything in one from one went from one way to a completely different way in approaching it. Well, if, yeah. Well, if you were to come, if you were to compare it to like foreign policy, which he's really passionate about, you know, it'd be like saying, well, I mean, we already have troops in these countries, you know, we're already deployed. We, you know, the government exists. So we need to keep them there. We need to still do some things. We destabilized we, them, so we got to do something. Exactly. And that's not how he is at all in foreign policy. He's he's a radical. Bring everybody home. It's it's to me weird. Um, I'm curious, Liz. We've talked a lot here, and obviously we spend a lot. Of, me, I'm sure me and Andrew have spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff. You spent considerably less time thinking about it. What are what are kind of your take on on the issue or the I guess the the discussion surrounding it? I mean, I, I understand the the ideas on the sides. Like, I understand the idea that the principal position is like, oh, well, we should all privately own the border and then blah, blah, blah. You can do what you want. And, you know, I, I get the, the pragmatic angle of, well, that's not where we are now. And, you know, what can we do with what we've got now? Um, and I understand <sighs> wanting to be principled, you know, and shooting people who are trying to find a better life for their families seems pretty shitty. So... Um, and, you know, stealing money from people to do more shooting people also seems shitty. So, uh, yeah, it, it seems like uh, kind of a, a thing that should be discussed. And I, I, I understand why people are discussing it. I, I don't really I'm not really a person that it's going to be like, oh, well, I'm I'm an authority on this and you're all wrong because this like that's just not my style. But, you know, I like I like hearing all the arguments for it. And well, I mean, technically, if you to be an authority on this, like the actual if you're to read like the the I guess, scientific like research on it, I think you kind of have to land where me and Andrew land because the research suggests, well, all of everything that they think and are worried about happening isn't happening, at least not right. because of that. Right. I think we, I think we, <laughs> we win the practical side as well as the thing. And that's, so that's what I like to write about, talk about the most is, you know, if you're not persuaded by the principles or the moral aspect of it, all right, fine. We got to go to the consequences, but I, I just think we can, you know, we have the winning side there as well and I think that's the thing that, you know, people hear the conversations about like, oh, breaking a few eggs or uh, that kind of thing. And, and I think people kind of get emotional about that stuff. And I think talking about the practical side is really what would win, win more people over to, you know, to the more principled position because they, they want to know that you are actually thinking of people as people, you know, and they I think maybe the media helps give the, that image of libertarians that they're all just very about like, oh, well, this is the logical thing. But in general, you know, in, in my reading and just kind of talking through stuff, like it seems like the more principled position is generally the better outcome for people overall. Like, you know, having the government decide for everyone has, has never really worked out well for everyone. Um, it's really interesting because, you know, I I have the... Um, the different kind of viewpoint than Nikki does, you know, there's different people in my circle and they're like, well, you have to think of, you know, poor people and think people who don't have the kind of money that you have or people who don't have the opportunities that you have. And so it, it's really, you know, important to kind of get that idea out there that you, you are thinking on the practical angle, which is, which is why I love, you know, reading, reading those articles. Yeah. That's why, that's why economics matters. Um, because if you do understand uh, the economics behind it, I mean, libertarianism principles, they're not just virtue signaling. It's, I mean, a big reason or part of the reason why a lot of us endorse those principles principles is because they have really great consequences. Yeah. That's, that's, I mean, and that's what stinks. It's like, they're not teaching the economics and it's not something that's out there and people just kind of hear it and they're like, well, that, I don't, that doesn't have anything to do with it with anything you know they just don't get it i don't get it yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I, so much of this is just I, i've been listening to the, this whole thing go on and i'll give it to dave he does he, it's not like he doesn't address it um i think in your case he was a little glib with his approach to it but he did he you know he did take the time out to do it oh yeah it was great that he i mean he didn't i don't think he's well maybe a little but i didn't think he tried to straw man me at all I, he went through it line by line so 
you know, props. No, for no, that. it's. I don't think he straw manned it. Like, but like in the way that you said, um, you know, you you believe certain things aren't private property, and he's just trying to neatly wrap everything up into private property distinctions. And while I do personally, I think side more in his direction on that. I can see how you can break it up differently. It's it's a very nuanced position at that point. I'm just glad that I'm not a complete lunatic on this because I've I've spent a lot of time just like stopping the fucking podcast in my car, breathing like God, you're fucking <laughs> trying not to throw shit through the window. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, <laughs> well, I have I haven't been that bad, but there, yeah, there's been some frustrating. In general, me and Dave have a, a love hate relationship to me listening to his show. I've stopped for months at a time over various things. When he became a conservative Christian, like it really it was difficult for me to listen. And so I think as well, I love. I love his commentary on a lot of things, like hmm. especially like just Curtis. Well, mostly what he does, he's, he focuses on criticizing the left. He does that great. It's just at the, he tends to be a little soft on the right. Like hmm. he had someone on, I remember who it was. It was a woman and she was like just comparing. They were talking about immigration. This was a while ago. And she compared, she said something like, well, you wouldn't, I mean, you lock your front door, right? So that means we should enforce the borders, I guess. And he's just like, you know, that's a that's a pretty silly thing to say. I mean, a house is nothing like a government border, but he didn't get any pushback that to that at all. You know, he just went with it. And I was just like, come on, Dave, you don't believe that. I mean. Well, but that's the thing. Clearly he does, because in his world, you listen to this, he clearly thinks that there is some type of mutual ownership of everyone to the state property. And the only way you can justify a belief in that is if you think cops are here to are here for us and they work for us. And I know he doesn't. He believes the state is something separate and that the state acts in its own interest. So unless, you have to concede all of that. You can't just pick the pieces you like. So Yeah, well, even if you think it's all collectively owned, I mean, it's still a leap to say the, the police should do anything. Yeah. <laughs> Like, well, is you, you, this is the thing that I liked about your, your rebuttal to his rebuttal is that you kind of get into, like, you're making some serious assertions to understand how any private property owner would, would deal with anything. Right. Like, you, yeah. you, wild leaps. Like, you think that everyone's just going to jump to the police as an excuse or as a, as a means? I, Yes. I don't think so that's he, even remotely possible. Yeah. So he ended up saying that, you know, like in a purely privatized society, it would basically be closed borders or he, he thought that was a possibility because, you know, property owners wouldn't let anyone in. But I just think that's you can't predict what property owners would do. That's the whole point. We have markets is because we need because we can't predict it. Otherwise, we could just essentially plan it. Well, and this is the thing, like. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm more of a panarchist in the sense that, like, there is no fucking way we're convincing everybody on Earth to follow, our, you know, the ANCAP, you know, s structure. That ain't sure. going to happen. So there's always going to be different people that choose to run their societies differently. I mean, and that's the one, honestly, that's the one thing I will give hop. Like, for all the, the, the left libertarians, which theoretically I consider myself a left libertarian, um, that'll attack Hop. I'm like, why? Why would you do that? This guy's giving you everything you want. You can just have it right now, right there. Like, boom, your society the way you want it on your parcel. Do whatever the fuck you want, and you can trade and deal with whoever you want to, or not trade and deal with whoever you want to. Um, I, I had a discussion the other day about specifically the whole. I was a discussion about a guy who saw covenant communities being run in a very specific way. And I'm like, but that's not how I see a covenant community being run at all. Like, for me, I know that if I were organizing a community, it would be organized completely differently. As, you know, I suspect Tom Woods and Bob Murphy would run a society different than my atheist ass. So, yeah, well, I'm somewhat of a anarchist myself. I usually call, like, I use the term like market anarchist. That's what. That's kind of why I don't emphasize property rights as much is because I think there's going to be different interpretations. Like I'm, I'm okay with there being different interpretations of property rights. You know, like there might be a little, little more communist like commune like um, communities or even like mutualist property norms where there's, you know, there's no renting and there's, you know, everyone owns where they live, you know, occupant, occupancy and use, that type of thing. Look, I'm all about all the commies starting all the communes they want. Yeah. And when they all die of starvation, I can homestead the property and sell it off for the price. Sure. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be the one stopping them. You go and do what you got to do, homie. Yeah. And perhaps that's a, a, not the most polite way to say it, but, you know, at the end, I do think that, a private property-based system is superior because, for me, private property, I look at it as perhaps one of the greatest inventions ever because it's the it's an idea where you, you, you've you created something that's now, it, it, it adds, if, if, even if it's an illusion, it adds something that people have a reason to protect. 
Otherwise, it would literally just be the strong taking whatever they want for their own. When you when you create property rights, you then add into society this ability to collect and amass things. That now that you can also lean on a community to say, "Hey, this is mine. We can all agree this is mine. Help me protect it." Whereas you don't have any moral justification in that until that exists. It's just okay. Well, that guy came and took it, so that guy came and took it. Yeah, well, it allow it allows a society or community to become rich yeah because you're able to accumulate property and you know like invest it if you don't own like your own property then or if everything's communal you don't have an incentive to um or you have you just you have the incentive to take as much as you can because you're not gonna be able to keep keep it at the fruits later on i'm astounded at how much note writing liz has done during this yeah oh, wow because I'm like, I don't, we didn't talk about that much. Like, well, no, I mean, the principles are interesting. The concepts are interesting. And I'm trying to, like, literally, words are how my brain works. So it just helps me to follow the conversation and kind of like, okay, that's what we're talking about now. I mean, <laughs> you know, since we only put links up on the page, like, I mean, we talked about that I know, many things is, to link. This is not for that. This is for my, my brain to, like, follow the conversation. <laughs> literally, like, how it works. Uh, do you think... Well, she is- She's definitely not a audio person. No, no, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I, I've honestly been talking about like, can't we like get a transcript of the show somehow? Because like, yeah. I would, I would read our show if I could. That's how I would do it. Yes, you can. It's expensive, <laughs> and I know it's when we're when we're rich podcasters, we can do some right. things like that. So. <laughs> I guess to kind of wrap things up, is there anything that you feel like we, we didn't really touch on that you'd like to you'd like to get out? I mean, we touched on a lot of shit there. So. <laughs> and, and perhaps yeah, not sure. in the most linear way imaginable because I'm a, I'm a ferret just fucking sure. all over the place. Well, the one thing, one other thing I, I mentioned in the, the la- my last article was about how like discrimination is costly, especially so if you're like in a business, especially like like road owners or commercial businesses. It's gonna it's gonna be really costly if they're gonna like discriminate against people based on where they're born. You know, it's the same thing as like I mean, it's not exactly the same, but if you're discriminating based on race, there's I mean, there's a lot of literature. Well, I mean, we know why Jim Crow laws exist, right? Based on how that um, that's not gonna persist in a market economy because people who arbitrarily discriminate are gonna get outcompeted because they're imposing costs on themselves. You know, they're gonna have less customers. As as a black woman, Liz, are you aware of why? Jim Crow laws exist? Yeah, because money's green and it doesn't matter what color the person Cause holding them, it is. Because them fucking trained people didn't want to give up that money and said, fuck it, you're going to sit where you're going to sit. We don't care. I'm making separate train cars. In the South, yeah, there was quite a bit of opposition to the to the segregation laws just from businesses, especially, yeah, trains and... Um, well, it's because they were going to make them... They were going to make them have the... Uh, a separate car for black people. Like, right. Fuck that. You're not putting a, you know, a- adding extra costs on me. This is how my business. This is how I run it. And I'm sorry that money's green no matter where it comes from, but that's your problem, not mine. Yeah, it might. And it might have even been like, well, it probably was that like train car owners were racist. It's just that. <laughs> right. They- <laughs> they're, they're like, well, there's going to cost more money if I have to separate you or don't allow you on. So I don't care. <laughs> Which to me is like the best way to do it. You, like you literally get them kissing your ass because uh god that money or you know if they don't want to participate then don't participate if they if their hate is so deep that they don't want to do that dude let them fucking go not let them go out of business yeah so there are some people who would probably be you know so racist or that they w- will give up a bunch of profit take the losses but then the people who aren't are just going to take their market share away from them mm-hmm. you know you can you can be that guy that has the occasional white person in, come into your bodega because it's it's you know close and that's the only reason they'd ever step foot in the place. There's a joke being white guys owning bodegas because all the everybody else is running serious businesses. Oh okay. <laughs> what? Thanks for telling us it was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> like what? It's it, it, it you know I think this is a function of I spend so much time in bodegas because of my job. Yeah. That like I have a very specific vision in my head of who, who the bodega owners are. I'm just saying it's not a white like guy. you're making very specific references that yes. I, I have no. Frame. Yeah, I, 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 it occurred to me after I said it that like you guys probably don't spend a lot of time in bodegas, do We're you? Both just like what? No. But there you go. I spend lots of time in them in my business, sadly, but less now than I used to. So that's there you good. Go. You know, uh, thank you so much for coming on, Andrew. It, it was, if nothing else, it was good to. For me to vent to somebody who <laughs> at least knows what the hell you're talking I, about. I mean, I run this. Yeah. I talk about this shit to Liz all the time. And she's like, I, "Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I can get it." 
why are you so angry about it? I'm, like, I'm not <laughs> angry. It's just you're like he's wrong. He's just wrong. Like he doesn't see he's wrong, and it makes me upset that he's wrong. And the people telling him he's wrong aren't telling him he's wrong the right way. And it's just uh. well, I'm glad I could help. <laughs> there you go. I it was it was a cathartic Saturday evening for me. There you go. Uh, once again, why don't you tell everybody where they can check out your stuff, man? Like I said, I, I've, I've read your work before. You do very good work. Yeah, principledlibertarian.com, uh, where all, and all my articles and stuff would appear in there. And I'm doing, I'm started doing like some shorter blogs too that'll go up in there. And then if I publish anything on any other sites, I'll republish them here. Nice. And then, uh, uh the principal libertarian on Facebook as well. You have a bit, you, uh, out of all the groups, um, that I'm a part of on Facebook, the actual principal libertarian group is probably one of the more reasonable discussion groups out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's pretty cool. Yeah. It's the principal libertarian community. That's, uh, yeah, I think there's over a thousand people in there now, and a lot of cool people. And surprisingly, most of the white ethno nationalists kind of got weeded out pretty quickly. Oh yeah, there's not many like that. All right. Well, you have yourself a good night, Andrew. We're gonna go do things. Thanks. Alrighty. Mom's gonna watch uh, some sci-fi movies or something, right? We'll see. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on, boss. Yep, had a good time. This podcast is a proud creation of the Mad Audio Lab. For more information, check out madaudiolab.com. Peace Freaks is part of the Liberty Hippie Podcast Network. If you like what we do, be sure to check out Homesteads and Homeschools, Free Markets Greener, Cannabis Heals Me, and This Week in Liberpods. We're living proof that libertarian doesn't mean washed up Republican.